Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Wednesday, August the 28th, 2024. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Maryland Department of Health's Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to today's General Ledger Collection Template Training and Technical Assistance Webinar. On the panel today, we have Elizabeth Peters, DDA Special Assistant, and Kristen Deal of the Hilltop Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options to hear the webinar by computer and phone. If you look at the panel interface on your right, labeled audio, you can click either computer or phone to switch for the best option. We will be recording the webinar and posting this session on YouTube and the DDA website. Today's PowerPoint has also been uploaded as an attachment and is available for you to download in the webinar panel box. If you are listening by phone, you can request that it be emailed. Questions can be typed in the question or chat box in the webinar panel, and we'll get to those towards the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Peters. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Thank you, Donna. And good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Maryland's Developmental Disabilities Administration, we'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar for the General Ledger Collection Template Training and Technical Assistance. Thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And I would also like to thank our panelists and partners with the Hilltop Institute for joining us and leading us through the webinar this afternoon. So Kristen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and welcome everyone. We're excited to have you with us this afternoon to talk through the general ledger template um, and specifically work through um, an example and cost category um, information um, specifically for our CCS provider agency. Um, and so a quick overview of our agenda today, we're going to take a look and walk through the template, um, review the instructions, talk about cost categories and how to make sure you're entering your costs in the right category. Um, look at an example template that shows the costs um, for a fictitious um, CCS agency as a reference. We're going to share with you some of the frequently asked questions that we've received over the past couple months from providers um, to help clarify some questions that you might have. We'll talk through how you will submit your template to us um, through our Qualtrics link, and then we'll share a slide with resources and then leave plenty of time for our Q&A session um, so we can be sure to address any of your specific questions. Next slide, please. Um, and so just a quick overview of the general ledger template data collection efforts. Um, so we are looking for all of your cost data for fiscal 2024. Um, and this really does serve as um, the general ledger template serves as the long term data strategy um, for the DDA to inform and support a data driven rate review process. Um, for those of you who follow along the rate review advisory group, um, this template has been discussed and we've received input from multiple stakeholders um, to allow us to collect the data and um, in a consistent way. And so the template was originally shared with providers back in 2023 um, in advance of the 24th fiscal year to allow time to adjust your books and data collection as needed. Um, we've had several trainings. Um, I know some of you have joined us um, based on the questions that we've received. Um, so hopefully you're feeling pretty confident um, about the template and today will be a good review and opportunity for those final questions. Um, as a reminder, the templates are due on September 30th, um, 2024. Um, as I mentioned, we shared the template back in 2023. So the, the current template that's posted doesn't have any new data elements um, on it. I will flag that there is an updated version of the template that is dated in July, July 17th. Um, and so we encourage you to use that template. Um, it actually just has some formatting updates um, based on providers who had been inputting data um, and some cells um, formatting that needed to be updated. Um, so please look on the website, um, the link is below um, for that most current updated version. 
Um, and so again, all of the templates and all of the supporting documents are available on the DDA RAG website. Um, here you'll find the, the template itself, instructions, frequently asked questions, recordings to past trainings. Um, I know um, the DDA will post the recording from today as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, uh, Mary Ann, and she will start talk, walking through the template um, instructions and we'll share an example. Great, thanks, Kristen. So I'm just working on pulling up what I wanted to um, show everybody first. <clears throat> and so if somebody could just confirm for me that you see um, G the GL data collection tool. We see the website. Yes, 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 sorry. Yeah. Um, so again, so um, I'm Marianne Mood, um, and I've been working with Kristen as well as our Hilltop colleagues and our Optimus colleagues. We, Caleb is on <laughs> the call as well to help um, lead the tra this training. So I wanted to make sure, as Kristen noted, that that link in the um, PowerPoint presentation um, shows where all the GL data collection tool item and related items are noted. Um, there's links for, there's a straight link for where to submit your completed GL template. And we'll talk about that after we review the actual template. There's also links to very detailed instructions that I'm gonna pull up. There's also a frequently asked questions document that we've created that you can also pull up to review. Then the GL data collection tool is there. And as Kristen noted, it is a July, look, please look for the July 17th version. If you've downloaded previous versions, it is important to use um, the most recent version. And then there's also an example GL template and we will probably be uploading, we're gonna actually, we have a bit more targeted one um, for the CCS providers and we'll work with DDA to get that uploaded <clears throat> after this training. There is also a link to the um, attestation form. So when providers submit your GL templates, you also have to submit an attestation form. And so that can also be found on the website. And last but not least, there are several trainings that we've done previously uh, that you could also go ahead and rewatch. And, even though they were targeted for different services, you still may find useful information listening to the review of the cost categories and how to divide them up. So I am gonna flip over to showing the actual template. And so I pulled up the template. You see that it is um, the DDA GL data collection template. Um, that's dated 717. This is the first tab is the background that just goes into the time period that you're going to be filling your data out for, which is fiscal year 2024. So that would be July 1st through June 30th. Um, all of, since we're just talking um, with our CCS providers today, it'll just be, you'll only have to worry about the LTSS Maryland and not having to figure out what to do with <coughs> billing that may have been divided between the two, set, the two um, systems, PCIS2 and LTSS Maryland. The data is gonna be collected um, again for fiscal year 24, but it's also going to be collected at um, the different geographic regions. So if you are either in the rest of state or the geographic differential, you'll actually divide your data up by those two regions. And then there's just some basic information about if you need to add rows when, you, when we get to actually looking at the tab where you're going to be entering all your data, um, where you should be putting them, where you should be entering your data. Um, because we've tried to color code the template for hopefully to make it a little bit easier. And this, the full template <laughs> actually has many, many, many tabs. Um, so because the template is covering all the residential meaningful day and support services, 
um, you guys are lucky enough, you can just scroll all the way to the end um, to pull up the targeted case management um, tab. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and flip to our example template. And so again, this is just the background information tab. <clears throat> if you want some additional instructions before you start filling out the tab, those and there are additional instructions posted on DDA's website and I will pull them up once we walk through this tab. Um, I'm just making sure that you guys are seeing the theme. that I am. Um, so this, this is our example template. Um, and so I want to flip to, so we've talked about this background tab. I want to go ahead and talk about the next tab, which is the provider information tab. Um, and on this, this is where you'll enter your information about your, the name of your provider organization. And I'll go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. The name of your provider organization, um, your LTSS um, Medicaid number, um, and your DDA provider number. Then you'll also put in the information about the person who's completing the template, as well as some additional information about when it was completed um, and how different cost allocation methods have been used across the cost categories. Anything that is in gray is where you would be entering information. So that's why um, you see some different colors on the template. Um, if we then go down, there's a question that's asking the billing system. Um, and again, that is because the template was designed to account for providers who were billing in either PCIS2 and LTSS Maryland. But since um, the CCS agencies are all in LTSS Maryland, that would just be LTSS Maryland. Um, then we ask some questions about direct support professional levels. Um, in this instance, we're equating uh, um, CCSs with DSPs. So anytime you see direct care worker or direct support professional, <clears throat> we're actually referring to C, um, CCS workers or the targeted case managers. Um, so that's kind of, that question has come up um, rather frequently when CCS agencies have reached out to us. We also then have um, the staffing pattern. So we're asking for the num for your number of either full-time or part-time employees um, that are CCSs. And again, it's also looking at vacancies um, and departures during the year. So just a lot of background information about your agency. If we go to the second tab, so this is the cost categories tab, and this um, is going to go through and define each of the cost categories that you'll see on the targeted case management tab. It's important to remember that it is possible that a cost category may not um, apply to your agency, but they are noted for all the services ac across the template. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. The first cost category is the direct care staff. And again, in this instance, we're referring to like the direct care staff are actually gonna be your CCSs. So that is their actual time that they're providing the targeted case management um, services that they're working with the participants or the clients. We also have an employment related expenses category. In this instance, this is looking at things like insurance, um, benefits, tuition reimbursement, fringe benefits, um, vacation or holidays, so any other type of paid time off, um, overtime, so just the overtime portion of the wages. And then it's also really important to remember that this portion, this employment related expenses, this is for all employees of your agency, not just your CCSs. There's also a cost category called program support. So this would be any other types of services um, that help deliver the, the targeted case management services. Um, so it could be equipment cost, IT expenses, if there's computers that are being worked on, um, that's, that would be an example of the program support. 
any type of, um, I do like, believe billing, if you have CCSs who are completing billing, those, the time spent completing that billing would actually go into the program support category. Um, so those are just some examples of what we mean by program support. Then for there's facility cost. So if there's a facility um, that your organization <laughs> runs out of, you would put cost related to running that facility um, and the facility cost. So any type of maintenance or rent um, or mortgage payments, um, utilities like water, phone, cable, internet would all go into your facility cost, cost category. Then we have transportation. And while there may not be any, you might not have um, separate people who are hired to do transportation um, for the participants you're serving, but if you have um, CCSs who are driving um, out to meet with clients, um, that mileage uh, would go into the transportation cost category. Um, and, and potentially like the time that is spent um, driving to the client or, or taking the client someplace would go into that trans transportation cost category. And then we have training. So I, we know, we're aware that there's required trainings for CCSs. So any time um, spent in training, those wages would go into this training category. And that could be for new staff hires as well as ongoing training um, that your CCSs may need to um, take part in. And then last but not least is the general and administrative um, cost category. So this would be your administrative salaries um, that would go into your general and administrative portion. And so now I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to flip to the actual tab um, for our targeted case um, management. And so this tab looks similar across all the services. Again, you guys can scroll all the way to the end um, and, and go ahead and start filling it out. As I noted earlier, we're actually going to have two different areas where you would um, fill out if you're work if you're providing services in a county that's in the geographic differential those counties are listed on that background page or if you're providing services in any of the remaining count counties you would um, complete the rest of state portion and if you're providing services in both um, you would actually be filling out information um, in both the rest of state as well as the geographic differential then we have each of the cost categories. So the first cost category is the direct care staff. And again, that is where you would be entering the wages for your CCSs, um, as well as, so the wages, as well as the hours in this instance. Then if we scroll over to employment related expenses, this is where you would be putting um, Wages in the instant in this instance, this is going to be for paid time off um, or vacation or holidays, any type of overtime. So the overtime portion of the wages and the time spent would also go in employment related expenses. And then again, some of those items related to um, either medical insurance, or fringe benefits, um, again, holiday pay, potentially staff appreciation. So these are the code descriptions. And the more the, the more detailed, the better in terms of the code descriptions, because that will help us when we're reviewing your templates to ensure that it's you've you've put the code description in the in the correct cost category. Um, the, there's also accounting codes um, that you should enter, but really the code descriptions are really, really important for us to understand that you've placed that code in the correct cost category. Then there's facility. Um, and so again, this would be um, things like utilities or phones or internet cost um, would all go in your facility. And if you have specific people who are doing maintenance um, on your facility, if you have maintenance workers, that's why there's a wages here, um, that would also go with your facility cost. And as noted, all of these 
uh, places where you're entering your information are actually color coded gray. Um, if you need to add additional rows, if you've run out, you have a lot more um, accounting code descriptions to put in, you can insert rows. We just ask that you do it above any pink row because these are actually going to automatically total for you because we have formulas um, embedded in the template. And then we program support. There's, I had noted earlier, like IT hardware or IT software, office, office supplies. These could all be things that are related to um, actually running the program um, and delivering that service. So in this instance, it would be delivering the specific service. And then we have training. So again, we know that there's um, required trainings for CCSs and, and when they're first hired, as well as ongoing trainings that may be required for staff. And so this is where you would enter those costs that are associated um, with the time that they're, they spend going to the training. So both the hours as well as the wages that are associated with it. And then transportation. Again, if you have um, CCSs who are driving um, to be their participants, this is where if your agency reimburses for mileage or the, the time a CCS may be um, spending doing that, that is where those costs would go. One of the other things to keep in mind, it's really important to not be duplicating costs across categories. So if you've entered in your CCS's wages and then you realized you included like the time they were spent transporting clients, you would actually need to go back and make sure you subtract it out of that direct care cost category um, and make sure it's put in transportation if that's what they were doing. And then the last the last category is general and administrative. So again, the wages in this instance are the wages for if you have specific um, administrative um, staff. And then if you have, <clears throat> um, if they're in a specific office space, things that are for cost of your general administrative staff would be like your utilities and your phone. Um, and if I, if we go back and we think about this provider information tab, and there's the different cost categories, and we've asked about if there's an allocation, how you're allocating costs. Um, this is one example where you may be having to allocate the cost for the um, facility or some of the utilities between what is being used to deliver the services to the clients versus um, what is being used for office staff. And that may be some type of allocation of like square footage um, for the office administrative staff versus um, where services may be provided to clients. Um, there's some total columns. Everything is totaled prior to adding in the general and administrative costs for you and then the general administrative costs are noted and then there's a second total that includes the GNA cost. If we scroll all the way over, um, we have the last couple of columns. We're looking for the total number of units that were provided, as well as uh, the total payments that were provided. So um, don't forget to scroll all the way over when you're filling out the information um, in the service tab. Then if we scroll down, there is also a table at the bottom that we're requesting providers also fill out. Um, and this has um, a couple of items. So it has the totals, total hours worked by the CCSs during fiscal year 2024, the total hours billed, as well as the total non-billable hours. Um, so that's getting into when we're talking um, up above. So total billable hours would be, you know, items in this first cost category with your direct care staff, or this will be your CCS, your CCSs. Um, and the time is spent that they're actually meeting with the participants and providing case management. Um, but if they're spending time um, performing billing, for instance, um, that would be in program support if they're, or if they're spending time in uh, training or transporting clients, those things would be considered non-billable hours. And that would be 
um, the total hours for this total non-billable hours. There's also a question about the number of comprehensive assessments that were completed. And so this is that initial assessment that is done for a participant when they um, you first start working with them in the DDA, if they're in a DDA wa waiver program, for instance. Um, there is also, um, we have a question about the total number of unduplicated participants served by the agency. And, and so by unduplicated, we just mean that you should only be counting a participant one time. Um, so if you have a participant who was served, I'm not sure what's going on with my computer. If you have a participant um, that was served by two different CCSs in your agency, um, you would only count that person once. So maybe they started working with a, CC, um, with a CCS person in August of 2024 um, and things weren't working out. So they flipped to a different CCS um, person within your agency in January um, or like, like later on in that month. Um, so maybe July of 2023, sorry. And then like January of 2024. Um, even though they worked with two different CCS um, folks, you would only want to count that person once because that is still just one person. We're not counting the number of times they were served by different CCS providers. Um, and then we're also looking for the total number of full-time CCSs, part-time. Um, so however your agency defines what a full-time employee is versus a part-time employee, and then it also, we're also asking for total onboarding hours um, and the number of folks who were hired in terms of part-time and full-time CCSs. So that is all of the example template. So now I wanna um, go back to um, show you guys the instructions. And so I've just, I've pulled up a set of instructions. Um, again, this is also on DDA's website that provides a bit more information than what is in the template itself. Um, we try to or organize it um, and hopefully a way that makes sense that you can scroll through it um, to look for information that's needed. Um, there's more detailed definitions of what we mean when we're talking about um, billable versus non-billable time and some of the data points that we're looking for um, as well as a, a lengthier discussion about cost allocation methods and what that might look like um, the definitions are or the different color coding definitions what each of the color um, coded tabs mean or what it means on the specific um, service tab so that is all in this instructions document. Um, also on DDA's website is a separate attestation form. Um, so once you have completed your general ledger template, um, an attestation form will also need to be completed. And then both of these will be submitted using um, the Qualtrics link. So I'm going to actually go ahead and flip over so you can see what that looks like. So I have um, flipped back to this GDA data collection tool um, website. And here is, there is actually a click here um, so that you could click on that where you would upload your GL data collection template and the attestation form. And so a couple of things that we want to point out is that the GL templates um, absolutely have to be submitted via the Qualtrics link. They um, should not be emailed directly to Hilltop. And this is because we follow CMS's, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services sales suppression policy. And because we're asking for um, um, the unduplicated number of participants, that could potentially be a small cell size. So to ensure that we're keeping participants' data safe, um, we again are 
requesting that you submit that GL template using the Qualtrics, Qualtrics link and that you do not email it directly to us. Um, so when you go to complete um, this Qualtrics instrument, there's just some basic information that we're gonna ask you for, um, the name of your provider organization, your Medicaid number, we, um, you potentially might have uh, multiple Medicaid numbers. If you do, please enter all of them. Um, and then the name of the person who's submitting the template, um, as well as the contact information should we need to reach out if you have any questions. And then here is where you can upload the Excel document, which is your GL template. Um, it does need to be <laughs> the Excel document um, in order for it to be uploaded. It won't take any other type of document, um, as well as the attestation form. It's a PDF form. Um, so once you have that signed, um, you can go ahead and upload that here as well. Um, then you'll be able to, you need to sign the screen and then you'll click on next once you've done that and then you'll get this confirmation of submission message. <clears throat> um, it'll populate with your, with your name of your organization um, and it will also populate with the date that you submitted. We do advise that you go ahead and print out this screen for your records. And at this point, I'm actually gonna go ahead and turn it back over um, for any questions or any other um, items that Kristen would like to walk through before we take questions. Great. Thanks, Marianne. Um, Donna, can we pull up slide six, please? Okay, great. Um, we've had the opportunity to hear from lots of providers um, over the past few months, and there's two kind of questions that we just wanted to flag today um, that have come up frequently and just talk through the responses. Um, so you guys have a good sense of where the, the cost should go. Um, so the first question um, that came up was the cost category for adding fringe benefits um, for the different types of staff. So this would be all the staff that your staff of your organizations, including your CCSs, you know, supervisors, administrators, um, you know, all staff um, that you employ. And so the response is, is that all fringe benefits for employees should be only be reported in the employment related expenses cost category. Um, so that is the one stop um, where all of those costs should go. The next um, question that we received frequently was where to add um, pay time off. Um, for staff as well as um, the overtime portion of overtime wages um, for again all different staff types and so this again all goes in the employment related expense cost category um, so hopefully that helps to clarify um, for overtime we've gotten lots of questions um, there's been lots of discussions about overtime and so the overtime um, you count the regular wage in your um, CCS or DSP wage category, and then the overtime hours and portion um, would go in your employment related expenses. Um, so that is split across those two categories. I believe that we have already talked through the template submission. Um, and so if we go down um, a few slides on, I think there's just one slide with all of the resources. Yep, keep going, next slide. Marianne talked to all of this and we looked at it. Great. Um, so this is a great slide with lots of um, good resources and links for you. Um, again, 
If you have any questions or want to set up some one-on-one -on -one time um, with our Hilltop team, we are more than happy to meet with you and respond to questions by email. Um, you can reach us directly at the email listed on the slide. Um, and as Marianne pointed out, there's recordings of training sessions that are available on the um, DDL, DDAGL data collection tool website. And then we've also included the link here for submitting your call tracks through call tracks. Um, Cause again, we won't accept any submissions by email. Um, if you do email it to us, we will ask you to go back and, and upload it to the link. Um, and just a, a reminder of our key target date, September 30th. Um, and with that, I think we have gone through all of the information we prepared to talk to you about today. Um, and we'd like to open the floor um, for any questions. I believe if you put them in the chat, um, we can get those read out and we can talk to responses. So we have a few, quite a few here in the question section. So I'm going to go ahead and read through those. Can you guys hear me okay on that end? Yes. Awesome. Okay, there was a question on whether there is a, a different template for CCS agencies. The template is the same, but there is a specific tab within the template for CCS agencies. Um, so as Marianne walked us through, if you pull up the general ledger template um, Excel spreadsheet, the C, um, CCS targeted case management tab is all the way to the right. It's the last tab. Next question is on, do you show the billing for state only funded individuals since it's a different invoice, not LTSS? That's a great question. Um, so the data collection template is collecting just the Medicaid um, covered participants that you're serving. Next question. Uh, what if you started LTSS mid fiscal year 24 in January 2024? Fill it out. Will you fill it out with six months worth of data? Yeah, we would be looking for um, all the services provided um, through LTSS. So the six months um, would be correct. All right. Next question. Um, are supervisors included as full-time CCS? We do not do case management 100% of the time. However, we are full-time employees. That is another great question. Um, so for supervisors who carry a caseload and provide supervision, the time providing direct um, case management services um, to the participants and individuals would go in the DSP wages and the time spent during supervision um, would go in program support. Um, and so you would pick your allocation method, you know, potentially based on percentage of time and just split your wages and hours um, across those two categories. Okay. In the employment expenses section, how should counties respond? Um, that's a good question. I might need a little more specifics. Um, we think it should primarily be the same, but if there's a specific um, cost that you're looking to um, get assistance with where to put it, um, feel free to reach out directly. Okay. Uh, for overtime, do we consider compensatory time? Supervisors cannot earn overtime, but instead compensatory time. So compensatory time should be equated. Um, oh goodness. Caleb, I might need you to weigh in on this one. It's compens and I guess it may be it's compensatory time paid at the same rate um, as straight time, um, or if there's an additional piece to the wage, um, it should be split. Are they getting an hour of compensatory time for every hour of overtime? Or are they getting an hour and a half of compensatory time for each hour of overtime? 
if it's just one to one, then it's just part of the wages, but any extra should be counted towards the overtime. Be part of the program support. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there recommendations for how health department CCS providers should gather this data for FY24? Since we are only receiving the training now, we're not given the opportunity to gather the data in real time. So we have to go back to gather year of data um, and health departments don't have um, departments specific to our CCS program like private agencies do. So are there any recommendations on how they should gather the data for FY24? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and so we did put out the template and the, the ask for the data um, in advance of the fiscal year. Um, but it may potentially be starting with the participants that you're serving or the participants that you served last year um, and working back into the staff that you had to provide the services, you know, reimbursements that you were receiving. Um, and working with your, you know, fiscal department to give you the allocation of the different cost categories um, for running the program. Okay. Um, are the employment related expenses for all staff? Yes. Okay. Do we change the code descriptions? Yes. Um, so the code descriptions in this sample um, really are just examples. Um, and we do understand that the cost codes are going to vary across the different organizations. Um, the goal is for us to get enough information from you and your description to be able to verify that the cost was put in the right category. Um, and so if it's vague, we likely will follow up with you and ask questions. Um, so the more kind of description you can give um, to confirm that it's in the right spot. Um, is super helpful. Okay. Um, for the health departments, the supervisors also carry a caseload. How can we accurately show when we were supervisors versus CCS? How would we account for ourselves? It is different daily. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think. It sounds like lots of providers are um, interested in, in how to allocate those costs. Um, and so again, the supervisors, you know, likely want to allocate their time. Um, and so even though it looks different every day, you know, using an allocation of the percentage of your time that you do supervisory activities versus providing direct services, um, and then just splitting your hours and wages um, in the different categories. So the direct CCS um, service time would be in the DSP. Um, category and then program support is where you would capture all your supervisory okay. um, Let's see here. I think this next question is similar to that question. Let's see here. Um, at the health department level, the supervisor carries many roles, caseworker with caseloads. QE, HR, et cetera. How do we separate those items? Yep, again, I think it just comes down to allocating your time across the different categories and then adding the, the wages associated with that time um, to the different roles that you play. Okay. Mm. Health departments also share the fiscal with the rest of the programs at the HD, would we account for, how, I'm guessing saying, how would we account for these? We do pay a portion to the HD and can account for that. I'm assuming we would only show what our budget pays for. Yeah, so definitely want to capture what your budget is paying for, um, but the goal is to capture the true cost for providing the service. So it might be helpful to talk to the fiscal department at, you know, within your health department um, to see what other costs might be allocated for your program that you may not be directly paying for. Um, so all the, the shared services type things, 
they likely can give you a percentage um, of what they pay and what's allocated for your program. Okay. Um, we do, okay, next one is, we do break out ongoing job supports from follow along job supports. Is it okay to include all the ES costs in MAES with a comment? That is one question where I'm gonna ask that they send us an email um, with some, some additional information and contacts to make sure that we um, are responding um, with lots of good background information on that. Uh, next question, health departments offer 1.5 times comp time in lieu of overtime. Um, RCCS can choose to receive either overtime or comp time. Uh, how should we determine that? I'm not sure if that was similar to that previous question. Yeah, that one sounds um, similar, but it had some, some good detail in there. So as Caleb said, we'd want to capture the straight time and wage in the DSP time and then anything additional um, in the ERE um, cost category, women-related expenses. Okay. Um, let's see here. Where do we record staff's time billing? Good question. I believe this is related to recording the billing, which is a non billable activity. Um, and so this one would go into program support. Time and wages for documenting your billing and adding activities in LTSS Maryland would be in program support. Okay. Um, what is the source for the accounting codes? Do we use our own general ledger accounts? Yes, um, you would use your own general ledger account. We do anticipate that these codes will look different across the different agencies. Okay. Um, all staff refers to DDA program staff only, correct? Not the staff of our entire multi-program agency. Yes, you'll want to capture the staff that are specifically dedicated to providing targeted use assistance services. Um, under tab cost categories define what should be placed in the gray boxes for each categories. So the cost categories define tab is a resource. Um, and so we would not expect you to add any information in that tab. Um, that's what you'll want to use um, as you are looking at your costs and adding them to the template. Okay. Um, how do you define onboarding? Um, so onboarding would be when you bring on a new um, CCS um, or someone providing um, target case management services. And so this would be the hours that you spend training that individual prior to them being able to um, provide services. Okay. Um, next question, we are within county government and as an agency, we do not pay for any of our rent or utilities. Um, they're paid out of another countywide fund. How do we address that in this form? It would be helpful if you can talk with your fiscal to see the percentage of the building that's allocated for your program um, and to get those costs um, so that we can, as we mentioned, accurately capture all the costs for providing this service. If it's a data point that you're not able to provide, if you can indicate that in the template um, and there's several areas where you can add additional information um, that will be helpful for us when we're reviewing um, so we're not questioning where that information will be. Okay. 
Um, next one, I thought I had seen depreciation expense included as program support on the example. However, the cost category definition, definition says to include it in, faci in the facility section. In what cases would depreciation be included in the program support? IT-related expenses? I'm sorry, Caleb, what was that? Is that IT-related depreciation? Not sure. Maybe basically if you could follow up, person who put that comment, that question in the chat, if you could follow up with more details, that'd be great. We'll circle back to it. Um, okay. Um, someone had a question about the trainings listed on the website are for providers, not CC. As TCM's providers, correct? Um, I think you're referring to the previous trainings that we did for the GL template, and those were just general um, trainings, those recordings that are currently on the site. This one is obviously the dedicated uh, training for CCS providers, and will be added to to the website following following the webinar. Um, next question is: since it is not billable to include time typing activity notes in LTSS, our agency does not track that. How do you suggest we get this information to report? So it may be taking the percentage of your CCS's time um, that you on average believe that they're entering activities into the system. So if it's 30 minutes a day, you can you know, do your allocation of you know how many um, you know hours and what those wages are to you. Okay. Then you want to remember that when you're reporting your DSP wages, you should be pulling out any of the non-billable time um, from that category. You know, so if you you have your full-time employees are working 40 hours a week, we would expect that a percentage of that would be allocated across the different categories to capture all the non-billable activity um, that are happening. Um, let's see. Mm. Uh, what is the methodology for calculating utilization and assumptions for net available hours, which are part of the current CCS rate methodology? So, I think it's probably the assumptions related to the training time and um, you know the non-billable time. And so really we're not looking for you to use, we're looking for you to get as close to what's accurately happening or you know actually happening at your um, agency as possible. So um, that may look different across the different agencies. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you define non-billable time? Um, so I believe there is a policy document um, that outlines the activities of the CCS um, that are billable versus non-billable. So one example that we've talked about today of non-billable time is when you're entering activities into the system. Um, and so that time for those activities would be put in program support as opposed to the direct, um, the DSP weight, DSP. Um, category, that DSP category should solely be for the time that your CCSs are providing services and billing time um, for targeted use management. All their other time should be allocated across the different cost categories um, to capture that unbillable time. Okay. 
Um, and then there were there a few comments, questions about whether or not an extension would be granted to CCS providers for um, submitting the GL template given the time of this training. And, I, and it sounds like some CCS providers were not aware, um, were not aware that they need, had to um, submit the template until they were notified about the training. That's definitely a question that we'll let DBA respond to you know, in terms of requirements and et cetera. Sure. I could take that back to the team, everyone. Good afternoon. It's Nicolette. And uh, let you all know. Nicolette. Okay. Okay, let me see here. I think we just about covered mostly everything. Um, there was uh, a question or comment. Um, sounds like a lot of guessing for non-billable and CCS versus supervisor and not accurate de data. HGs don't have the quality assurance people to do this task. Is the best way to do a one on one session with you? Sure. I mean, we're definitely looking for you to be as accurate as possible um, in your accounting. Um, and so we would be happy to set up um, one on one sessions. Um, we've already met with several of the CCS agencies. Um, so please, please um, reach out to us. We're happy to schedule, happy to respond to your questions by email. Um, we're here to support you um, as best we can to complete the template and get your data in. Um, let's see here. I'll jump in just and fill in a minute here um, and just give some general advice. General I'm, advice. Oh, I'm Caleb, I'm the one that's actually going to be doing the analysis on this data. Um, the one thing that the most common error I see is that people put multiple, they, they put the same cost in multiple categories. The intent is that we capture the entire cost, but we don't double count. So, you may have trouble allocating how much goes to this category versus this category. Do your best to estimate it with the cost, but don't double count the cost. The total cost of all the services should be here, but don't double count them. And, and you know, do your best and explain in the notes when you've made an assumption about how to estimate that. Thank you, Caleb. And I know that we are nearing the hour mark, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. So all questions um, and any requests for technical assistance should be submitted to Hilltop. As they've said, they're more than happy to sit down and walk through this with you if you have any additional questions or need additional assistance. Um, their email address is on the screen. It is DDA underscore rate at hilltop.umbc.edu. The link for the uh, template submission on Qualtrics is also linked in um, on this screen and all templates are due by September 30th. Um, so this should be a handout for you in the uh, side pane the presentation so you can go back and reference and have access to all of the links. And then also, again, um, the recording of this session will be available on the DDA website for your review and reference to go back to. So I'd like to thank our panelists one more time for um, their time this afternoon. And also thank you to all of the attendees for taking the time out of your day to join us for the webinar. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you all.